Okay, guys, I want to start with a little bit of review and then go on. Okay, remember we talked last time about why there is what we call machlokas, why you can end up with differences of opinion, right? Um, I switched the order of what we're going to do today next time, by the way. We're not going to do rabbinic Judaism today, we'll do that next time. Today I want to go on a little bit in um, the flow of how the, in the development of the oral Torah. Because the last time we talked about how you can have differences of opinion in that middle category of oral law that we talked about, the part that is derived from Sukim, derived from the written Torah, where we talked about how you can end up with different realities, and it's all true, we just have to figure out which one the Jew Jewish people are going to follow. Okay? Now, remember we talked about, so now, in the grand scheme of things, we have now talked about, right, we had the written Torah and the oral Torah, right, the oral Torah remained oral until it was written down in the Mishnah, written down by Rabbi, very good, Rabbi Yudha Nasi. And about 300 years later, the, the commentary on the Mishnah was written, the explanation, which is Gemara. And Gemara plus Mishnah equals? Talmud, excellent. Which Talmud? <laughs> no, Talmud Torah means the study of Torah. Close, the other one. Right, Bavli. Right, the Talmud Bavli is the Babylonian Talmud, right? That is the one that was written down later, the one that we discussed is most prominently studied in the Jewish people today. Okay, so we've discussed up until here. And we said in the Talmud there are three different types of things, right? Things that we have direct lines going all the way back to what was given to Moshe at Mount Sinai, things that had to be derived from the psukim, from the written Torah, and we talked about there are two different approaches to why was that, either because Hashem left us some of the work to do ourselves, or because some things were forgotten, but the Torah was the emergency reboot disk, right, remember that? And then we talked about that there's a third kind, which is rabbinic enactments, which we're going to talk about coming attractions, okay? I want to talk about what happened next. Right, so in about the year 1000, or sorry, about the year 500, the Talmud was sealed. Now that was over 1500 years ago, right? So what happened after that? Okay, like you, remember, if you lived here before the Mishnah, so what you did when you studied Torah was you went and you watched the people who sat in the middle, right? The Torah scholars would sit in the middle, everybody else would sit around on bleachers, and they would watch them discuss the oral Torah. After the Mishnah was written down, what changed? Now what did you do when you wanted to study Torah? You studied the Mishnah, right? And for the first time, you might sit there with a book in front of you, right? And then, after this, if you wanted to study Torah, you studied the Gemara, right? Now, just as we said that when the Mishnah was written down, it was written in a very terse way, right? Which is almost cryptic. And if you don't know what to do with the Mishnah, you'd look at it and you'd say, I don't know what this thing is. I don't know what it means. I don't know why it says what it says. Even if you read Hebrew, right? So the Gemara was the experts of the time explaining what the Mishnah means, right? Why use this word and what about if we change this variable and what does this mean and why does it say it like this and how does this work with that other Mishnah over there that seems to contradict it, right? That's all what the Gemara did. Now, the Gemara is much longer as I showed you than the Mishnah is and yet, if you don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to learn Gemara either. I mean, Gemara was written, first of all, not, it, what language is the Gemara written in? Aramaic. But even if you speak perfect Aramaic, anybody here speak perfect Aramaic? Because it was written in Babylonia. Right? That's why it's called the Babylonian Talmud. And in Babylonia, they spoke Aramaic. Right? The Mishnah was written in Israel, therefore it's written in Hebrew. Right? Good question. Okay, so the Gemara is written in Aramaic, but even if you read fluent Aramaic, right, so you still have to work out the Gemara. It's not so simple exactly what it means. There might be different ways to understand it. And again, what if I would change this variable and how do I adapt this to this new situation that came up? Right? All of that is stuff that even if you could read all the words, right, you'd still have to figure out what exactly does it mean. So the people who came after the Gemara, their job was to explain the Gemara, right? which is not just like reading a book. It's a real process where well, you have to go through and try to understand what does it mean, it could be understood like this, it could be understood like that, right? Maybe it means this, maybe it means that, and what do I do with these two pieces of Gemara in different places that seem to contradict each other, right? They, we, we expect there not to be contradictions in the Talmud, therefore if it seems to contradict each other, it must be we misunderstand one of them, right? So all of that is what you do when you study Gemara. Now as time went on, people became worse at studying Gemara, right? Because they had less of a tradition of exactly how to do it. So therefore we needed 
more things written down to tell us not only what it says in the Gemara, but what the Gemara means, right? Now, the people who came immediately after the times of the Gemara were people called the Savarayim. You probably have never heard of them, and you probably, you might never hear of them again, right? We don't have a lot of writings from the times of the Savarayim. They, most of the writings were lost, but they, that was the next time period. By the way, anybody remember we talked about this? The rabbis of the Mishnah period, what were they called? Man of the Great Assembly. Well, they were some of the members of that time period. But the general name for those people is Tanaim, or Tana, right, is the singular of that. Right? The rabbis of the Gemara period are called Amoraim. Or Amora is the single of that. Right? Tanaim, again, we said that Mishnah means teachings, right? So Tanaim are teachers, right? And Amoraim, the word Amor, Lemur, does anybody know what that word means? Good, to say. They were sayers, because what they did was they talked about the Mishnah, right? So Savoraim, one of them is called a Savorai, right? And Savarayim really means thinkers, right? What they did was they thought about the Gemara, and they said, that's interesting. What does that mean? Why does it say this? Why does it say that? How do we resolve this difficulty, right? And that's what they started to do. Now, after them came a group of people called the Gaonim. What does Gaonim mean? Anybody know what a Gaon is? A genius, right? So they were the real geniuses, right? Singular of that is Gaon. And again, we don't have so many writings in that time period. We do have some. But the big time period for our purposes is the one that came next, which is the time period of the Rishonim, or one of them is a Rishon, right? Now, again, the Rishonim's primary job was to explain the Gemara, right? So you've heard of a lot of Rishonim. And this takes us, by the way, up to this was the time period of about zero to 500. The Savarayim and Gaonim were about the time period of 500 to 1,000. And this is about the next 500 years. Right? This period of 500 years, we have a lot of the writings from that time period. And much of what we do when we study Torah today is to study the words of the Rishonim. OK, now again, you're about to hear a lot of, word, a lot of names that you might recognize, right? Remember, we said some of the most famous Tanaim were people like Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, um, Rabbi Shimon, Shimon Bar Yochai, Hillel, Shammai. Those were all people from the Mishnah period. Those were all Tanaim. Some of the fam most famous Amoraim were people like Rav, Shmuel, Rabbi Yochanan, Reish Lakish, Rav Ashi, Ravina. Right? Those were all people from the times of the Amoraim. Okay, so when you hear those names in your classes, right, if it's somebody like Hillel, Shammai, Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Meir, that's a Tana. If it's somebody like Rav, Shmuel, Rabbi Yochanan, Reish Lakish, that's an Amora. By the way, did you ever notice sometimes people are called Rav and some other people are called Rebbe? Yes, please explain that. I will. <laughs> right? Anybody know what the difference is? Again, not talking about in our generation. In our generation, these words are kind of used interchangeably, right? But I mentioned Rabbi Akiva, right? Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Akiva was a Tana, Rabbi Yochanan was an Amora. But I also mentioned Rav Yehuda, who was an Amora, right? And um, we could talk about. Is uh, it Rebbe Meir? Yes, it's Rebbe Meir, right? So why? Anybody who lived in Israel is called Rebbe or Rabbi. Anybody who lived outside of Israel is called Rav. Right? Now, all of the Tanaim lived in, well, not Jerusalem, but Israel, right? Up north, remember we said in the Galilee, oh, right? You know, right? right? And we said Rabbi Yehuda Nasi lived in a place called Tzipuri, which you can go to up north. Remember I talked about it, we rode, rode the donkeys, right? You were right near Tzipuri, right? Okay, so you ever ride donkeys up north? No? You will someday, God willing, right? So, right? so all of the Tanaim, are called rabbi. Now, some of them are just called nothing, like Hillel. He was too great for the title rabbi. He was above that, 
right? But you will never find any of the Tanayim were called Rav, right? Because they all lived in Israel. Whereas in the times of the Amorayim, where did they live? Amorayim. And? Other places. Like? That are not Israel. And? <laughs> and Israel, right? Oh, yeah. Some of them, most of them lived in Babylonia, but some of them lived in Israel, right? So therefore you have two contemporaries, one who was called Rav, his name was just Rav, right? And another one in Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan lived in, his name was Rabbi, so where did he live? Israel, Israel. good. Whereas Rav Yehuda lived? Outside Good, now here's, a, here's an interesting one. There are two people named Rabbi Yehuda and Rav Yehuda. One is Rabbi Yehuda and one is Rav Yehuda. One of them was a Tana and one of them was an Amura. Which one do you think was which? Rabbi Good, right? Some of the Amorim were also rabbi. But if I'm telling you one of them was rabbi and one was Rav, and one was a Tana and one was an Amora, the one who was a Tana must be rabbi. The one who was an Amora could be Rav. Right? So therefore, Rabbi Yehuda lived in this period, but Rav Yehuda lived in this period. Yeah? How come the Rav and Rabbi thing is the other way around? Because in Hebrew, Rabbi is Rav. So like, wouldn't it make more sense? Uh, well, again, it's really the same word. Right? Rabbi just means my Rav. Right? The word in Hebrew, right, the word rav means teacher, right? And the word um, rebbe just means my teacher, right? Um, so rabbi and rebbe are equivalent? It's just a pronunciation thing? Um, you, well, it's, it's a demarcation. It's actually a little more complicated than that. In Israel, they had something called smicha. Today we use smicha to mean rabbinic coordination. But back in the times of the Mishnah, there was actually a Torah dictated process called smicha, right, where they would actually, the word smicha actually means to lean on, right, and they would actually lean on the person's head and pass to them that they were the, next, the rebbe of the next generation, right, the rebbees of the next generation, right. So once they left, that can only be done in Israel. So once they left Israel, then they didn't get the status of rebbe anymore, so they were just called rav. But today, some people are, you know, Rabbi Marcus, and some people are Rav, so and so, some people Rav their first name, the Rav their last name, Rav Gav, right, whoever, right? And then in Hasidic circles, you have the Rebbe, right? The, the Rebbe of Satmar, or the Rebbe of Lubavitch, or the Rebbe of Bretzlov, right? So they're different today, they're just kind of different words that people use interchangeably, right? Okay? You're welcome. Fine. So then we get past this time period and we get to the Rishonim. Now the Rishonim are people like. Rashi. Anybody ever hear of him? Good. Anybody ever hear of the Rambam? Yeah. Good. The Ramban? You've heard of him. Good. Um, yes, I'll talk about that in a second. The Rajba you might not have heard of. Okay, these are all Rishonim. Now, up until here, well, except for Tosfos. Right? Why, what do you notice about a lot of them? Remember we played the game, I can bring balls and I can't bring other things? Right? Good, they all start with R. Why do all these people's names start with R? Good, the answer is their names don't start with R. Right? The Rashi was not named Rashi. The Rambam was not named Rambam. Right? The Rajba was not named Rajba. Right? These are acronyms. Interestingly, today in Israel, there is in modern Hebrew, there is a girl's name. The girls are named sometimes in certain communities named Rashi, right? But there was no guy walking around named Rashi. Wow. Rashi's name was Shlomo. Wow. And his father's name was Yitzchak. So how did he get the name Rashi? Rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki. Right? In Hebrew, that's Rabbi Shlomo from the house of Yitzchak, Yitzchaki, right? So if you take the R, the Shin, and the Yud, you get Rashi. Amazing, huh? The Rambam, somebody said, was that the same person as? Maimonides, why is he called Maimonides? No, Maimon was his father, right? He was Rabbi Moshe Ben, the son of Maimon. R M B M Rambam, right? That's where Rambam comes from, right? Rab the Ramban was Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman. 
Ramban, and that's where he, why people call him Nachmanides, right? Because he's named after, he's from the house of Nachman, right? If you go up north to Tiberias, you can see where the Rambam is buried, and right next to him, right, you can go across, literally right across from him, the grave of Maimon, who is his father, right? So that's why he's called Maimonides, he's called Nachmanides. Now, how do you tell when somebody, right, especially rabbis, when they are saying Rambam or Ramban, sometimes it sounds very similar. How do you know which one they're saying? So this is just a little tip, right? That when we say Rambam, we always put the, the stress on the first syllable. When we say Ramban, we always put the, syllable, the stress on the second syllable, right? So if you thought you heard the rabbi say Rambam, you probably heard wrong, right? Because he probably said Ramban if his stress was at the end, right? I always say we all start Italian when we say the Ramban. Right? But that's how we say it, Ram Ramban, right? Rambam, Ramban, right? The Rambam lived first. So that's how you can remember that it's Rambam, Ramban, okay? Um, right, the, and etc. The Rajbam's name was Shmuel, right? Actually, the Rajbam's name was Shmuel. I think the Rajbam also maybe, right? The Ritva's name was Yom Tov, his first name, right? So the I, or what is it, Yud in Hebrew, right? And the T, is a tet, Yom Tov, Ben, or I'm not sure what the V is for, Ashkenazi was his last name, I believe. Right? Ibn Ezra is actually Arabic. Right? Ibn in Arabi Arabic means? Good, it means Ben, it actually means son. Right? But Ibn in Aramaic means Ben in Hebrew, so he was the son of Ezra. Right? So they called him son of Ezra. Right? These are all people in the, the period of the Rishonim. And what most of them, their job was to do was to go through the whole written Torah and the whole oral Torah and write commentaries, right? They were no longer creating a Talmud. That was over. That was sealed after here. They were now writing commentaries. So, for example, Rashi wrote a commentary on the whole written Torah, all five books of the, of, of the written Torah. What is that, what's that called, the five books? Chumash, right, from the word Chamesh, right? And what's... When you add to that the other books of the written Torah, there's the books of the prophets, which is called what? Anybody remember? Nevi'im, and then the books of the Ksuvim, the writings, and all that together is called the Tanakh, which is an acronym for Torah, Navi, Ksuvim, right? So they, Rashi wrote a whole commentary, a commentary in the whole Tanakh. The five books of the written Torah, all the books of the prophets, all the books of the writings, right? And on almost the whole Talmud, right? Really on the whole Talmud. Right, he wrote a commentary. He wrote several versions, actually, of his commentary on the Talmud. Right? By the way, Rashi lived from the years 1040 to 1105. I always tell people, I heard one of my teachers taught me this once, and I never forgot it. Rashi lived from 1040 to 1105. It was the most productive 25 minutes in history. <laughs> Get it? Right? So at this point, somebody usually says, wow, Rashi only lived to be 25. Which, of course, is not true. How old was Rashi when he died? Uh, you can do it. 65, right? That's 1040 to 1105, 65. 65 years, in addition to being a wine merchant, right? He wrote, grew his own, he had his own wine, uh, grape orchards and was a wine, wine merchant. And he managed to somehow write a commentary on the whole Tanakh and the whole Talmud. Okay? I'm I, I, I don't know if that's possible. What? Look, it is possible. I mean, again, remember, like I said, Rashi never checked his Facebook. He never checked his email, right? And the sun went down at night, and he sat inside with a candle, and there was nothing else to do, right? And he worked very, 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 very hard, right? You look at, you know, a, a, a law textbook or a medicine textbook, and it's, you know, six, you know, six volumes of 1,000 pages each. And you say, how in the world could somebody write that, right? So somebody worked very hard on it. So the Havdil Rashi dedicated his whole life, probably from the time he was 12, to I am going to write a commentary on the, on the Torah. Now when Rashi wrote his commentary on the Torah, or at least his commentary on the Talmud, he didn't write it. Remember, we looked at a page of Talmud and we saw that it's in the column, right? So he didn't write it on the page. What he did was he wrote little pamphlets and he distributed them, right? And he didn't necessarily intend that this was going to become the primary commentary on the Talmud, 
right? But it came to the point where people, he, he was so instrumental in explaining what the Gemara meant, people couldn't live without it. Is I, I don't know how we, anybody understood the Talmud before Rashi came along, right? So they started incorporating this into the very text of the Talmud, right? And you'd have that middle column that we saw, and then on the inside you would have Rashi, right? And you'd have the commentary of Rashi there, right? Many of the other commentaries, when they refer to Rashi, they refer to him as the Kuntras. Right? Kuntras means a pamphlet. Right? They didn't call him by name, they just called it the Kuntras, right? the pamphlet. Because right, that's how it was distributed to people. Okay? Um, now, Rashi didn't have any sons. He had daughters. Right? If you've heard that his daughters put on tefillin, that is an urban legend. It's not true. Right? But Rashi's grandsons started a school. Right? And what they did in the school, this was fascinating. What they did in the school was they said, listen, we are going to write, continue writing commentary on the Talmud. But we don't just want to look at the Talmud like at this line or this page. We want to look at all 2,711 pages of the Talmud and figure out the interweaving of all the different parts of the Talmud with each other. Right? So what, what this school of people did was they said, listen, we want great Torah scholars to join our school. And what we want you to do is wherever you live across Europe, which is where they all lived, right, we want you to become an expert. Obviously, we've all learned the whole Talmud. But become an expert in one tractate of Talmud. Right, so you're the expert in the one called Kiddushin, which is about marriage. And you're the expert in the one called Gitin, which is about divorce. And you're the expert in the one called Brachos, which is about making Brachos. And you're the expert in the one called Shabbos, which is about the laws of Shabbos. Right? And we'll have two heads of school who will be experts in everything. And what we'll do is we will decide every six months we're all going to study the same tractate. Right? And every time you come up with a question on that tractate, that Masechta, right, I want you to write it down. And when we come together and have our convention every six months, you will ask the question. They came together and had conventions. One person was, was named the scribe for that convention, the secretary, right? And everybody would go through and ask all the questions that they wrote down. And somebody would say, I have a question. Why does he use this word over here? And somebody else would say, well, I'm the expert in the tractate called Shabbos. And I know right now we're learning the tractate called Kedushin, but there's something in Shabbos that answers your question. Somebody else would raise his hand and say, wait a second, I'm the expert in the tractate called Brachos, and if you say that answers the question, then what about this problem that, that says this over here in Brachos? And somebody else would answer that question, and the scribe wrote it down, right? And then, by reading, by learning that, you now could understand how these things fit together and what I can learn about this section of the Talmud based on what it says over there, and what I can learn about there based on what it says over here, right? Who were those people? That was the school called Tosfos. Right? Tosfos, or Tosafot, means additions, right? It either meant additions onto what Rashi wrote or it meant additions onto what the Talmud wrote, right? And it, that's what's on the other side of the page of the Talmud, right? So in the middle you have the Talmud, on the inside of the page you have Rashi, and on the outside of the page you have what these, the, the school of Tosfos wrote down, right? So when you look at a page of Talmud today, right, which we looked at, I'll bring it again next time, right? You have in the middle the Talmud, on one side, Rashi, and on the other side, Tosfos, right? And that's what people, the kind of bare minimum that people are learning when they learn Gemara. They're learning the Gemara with the commentary of Rashi, and then they look at the Tosfos and see how that fits with everything else, right? Okay, any questions up till here? Fine, now, um, that, is, that explains how commentary was written on the written and oral Torah, right? But there was something else. There was another problem that people started to have. If you want to know a halacha, a Jewish law, how do you find it? What do you do? Ask a rabbi. Ask a rabbi. Good. What does the rabbi do? Asks his rabbi. Somewhere, somebody doesn't have anybody else to ask. Right? What does he do? How does he find the answer? You say, Rabbi, am I allowed to brush my hair on Shabbos? Right? Where would I look to find the answer to that question? Well. There's a tractate called Shabbos, right? And the tractate called Shabbos has a hundred and something pages, right? Double-sided, right? So I could sit down and learn the whole tractate because it's not clear to where to look in there to find that question, right? So I could sit down and look to learn the whole tractate, which take me a couple of years, right? And then I could get back to you with the answer, right? You want to say something? Yeah, can't you look it up where it talks about snooze, or talks about whatever, like it is, sorry, it's news on my mind. So, like, look up the line where it says that and then connect it in the oral Torah? 
Well, let's say it's something. Remember, all it says in the written Torah about Shabbat. Yes, but all it says in the written Torah is don't do malacha on Shabbos. That's all it says. Now, on Shabbos, you can't do something called malacha. We don't even know what malacha is, right? Let alone that there are 39 categories of it, right? So, yes, I need, and that's how I got to the tractor called Shabbos, because that's where it discusses the 39 malachot, right? The 39 malachos. But I don't know which one is where necessarily. There are chapters. Right, and I might be able to say, look, this is the chapter that mostly deals with that kind of thing. Right, but I have to, but even a chapter is, might take me a month to learn. What's yeah. the difference between malacha and muksa? Malacha is 39 categories of things we don't do on Shabbos. Muksa is something that was rabbinically added. We can talk about that next time. Which means that things that we can't use on Shabbos, very simply translated, things that we can't use on Shabbos, we can't move on Shabbos either. Right, for example, writing is a malacha. Since writing is a malacha, I can't use a pen, therefore a pen is muktza. So muktza is like actual objects. Yes, yes. Okay. Right. Muktza literally means set apart. It's something that that's not for me on Shabbos. Why? Because its function is for malacha. Oh, okay. Right? Okay, good question. Okay, so I would have nowhere to, no idea where in the tract called Shabbos to look. Not only that, but there, you know, the Talmud is written in very kind of... Um, prose form and even almost stream of consciousness form. One idea can lead into another. There could be other tractates that talk about some of the laws of Shabbos. For example, there's some of the laws of Shabbos in a tractate called Ksuvis, which is about a ketubah, right? And it just happens that the Torah gets to, the Gemara gets to a specific law about Shabbos, and there are a few pages in the middle that are about the laws of Shabbos. And there's another tractate called Beitza, which is about what happens if an egg is born on Yontiv, right? Whether I can use it, right? But because we're talking about Yom Tov, so that tract it also gets into a lot of laws of Shabbos, right? So if I am looking for a law, I basically have to learn all 2,711 pages of the Gemara, right? And then I can figure out where it is. Now, once I find out where it is, there might be three different opinions, right? Remember last time we talked about, what, should I sit down or stand up when I say Shema? So if I finally found where that is in Brachos, right? So I would... Then find out, oh, well, wait a second, Beis Hill says this, Beis Shammai says that. What do I do? Right? Okay. So until then, all you could do was go to somebody who was a massive Torah scholar, who knew the whole Talmud, right, and could tell you, I know where it is, I know what it says, there are different opinions, and this is the one we follow. Right? But as we went into exile, and that wasn't so, so uh, readily accessible all the time to find somebody like that, the Rishonim, part of their job was to make sense of how to look up Jewish laws, right? How to look up halacha, okay? So several of the Rishonim dedicated their lives to dealing with that problem, right? There was somebody named the Rif, who again, his name wasn't the Rif, his name was Rav Yitzchak, right? But the Rif, what he did was he went and wrote on every tractate of Gemara, he wrote a short version of the Gemara which just kind of got to the bottom line, with some of his own commentary as well, right? So for example, when there's a difference of opinion, he will sometimes only quote one of the opinions, right? So that you know, this is what the Jewish law follows. Now that's not gonna help you if you don't know where to look, right? But at least it's gonna help you if you find the halacha, you know who, which, who, to, who to follow, right? So that's what he did, right? And that was a, a revolutionary concept, and to this day we have the riff, it's in the back of most of the Gemaras, and we use it very often when we're trying to figure out the halacha. But then came along somebody who did something very monumental, right? Back to our friend, the, the Rambam, right? Now, what did the Rambam do? The Rambam said, you know what? It's gotten to the point where not everybody can learn the whole Talmud. I am going to make a halacha book. I'm not only gonna write a commentary on the Kamara, I'm actually gonna make a new book. All of the information in the book will be from the Talmud, right? The way I understand the Talmud, right? But I'm going to write a reference book so you can look up halacha. And he went through and did kind of what the Rift did, but then he reorganized it into chapters so that you could look things up by book, by chapter, by halacha, in bullet point form, right? Chapter three, halacha one. Chapter three, halacha two. Chapter three, halacha three, right? And you can go through and he will tell you, in that order, what the halacha is, according to him, right? Now, 
This was very, very radical at the time he did this. It was so radical, you and I hear the word Maimonides, we hear about the Rambam, like one of the great figures of our history. At, th at the time, they burned his books, right? It was so radical, this idea of creating a new book, right? And not only that, but he called his book the Mishnah Torah, which in this context meant the repetition of the Torah, right? In some ways, the new version of the Talmud. Like, the Talmud was what they used to learn back then, but now we're going to learn this, right? And people today still learn the Rambam, right? Now, we often use it as a commentary in the Gemara, but some people just open the Rambam and start learning the Rambam, right? And the Rambam is a halacha book. You can actually look up the halacha in there, right? That was a very radical idea. Another Rishon came along, called, who we call the Rush. His name was Rabbeinu Asher, right? That's how he became the Rush. And he did something very similar to the Rif. He also decided, when there were differences of opinion, which one we're going to follow. Okay? Now that meant we had three Rishonim, right? There were others as well, but these were the major three who went through the whole Talmud and said, every time there's a difference of opinion, here's who we follow. What was the problem? Three Jews, right? Two Jews, three opinions, three Jews, right? Lots of opinions. So sometimes they don't agree, right? So can I brush my hair on Shabbos, right? They happen to agree about that one, but let's say, right? I might look in the riff and he'll say no, and then I'll look in the Rambam and he'll say yes, and then I'll look in the Rosh and he'll say it depends, right? So what do I do now, right? Okay, huh? Pick your favorite, right, good. Right, so because, right, you know, they, they joke that uh, there's a database in Israel that you can type in your question, you can type in which answer you want, and then it'll tell you which rabbi to go to. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they probably have it, right? Okay, so uh, and we're going to talk next time about what happened from there, but at this point, life would have been very confusing. Now, thank God people came along later and made life a lot easier for us, right? But at this point, these were the kind of, they're called the three pillars of Jewish law, because they were the ones who went through the Gemara and took out for us what does the Jewish law follow. Okay, from them will come what we have today as our sources of halacha. Okay, so we'll continue with that next time.